Hi folks and welcome back to The Shack. This is Joe N2DI today with the much anticipated, at least by me, QRP Labs QMX. The QMX is a palm-sized 5-watt 5-band transceiver that currently supports CW and digital modes and at some point in the future, single sideband as well. There are currently three band grouped versions of the QMX. The low band one gives you 80, 60, 40, 30, and 20 meters. The high band one gives you 20, 17, 15, 12, 11, and 10. And yes, I said 11 meters too. And as of recently, there is a mid band version that gives you 60, 40, 30, 20, 17, and 15 meters. This is a feature packed transceiver and it's still under development, so there are more features coming. But in its current form, it is very usable as a CW rig, especially with the latest version of the firmware. I'm going to say this up front. In my opinion, this is probably the best value in a palm-sized rig. I say that because I actually own the Pentec TR35, the Venus SW3B, and the BG2FX FX4CR. They're all great transceivers, but the QMX is the best value in my opinion. You get the most features for the cost. If you put cost aside, well, okay, the FX4CR is the only rig that I've mentioned that comes close to beating the QMX, but the firmware on the FXCR still needs a lot more work, in my opinion, to catch up. I also can't speak for the Eleanor Mountain Topper because I don't own one. Folks who actually own a Mountain Topper, let me know in the comments below if you recommend getting one. I mean, I need another palm size rig like a hole in the head, but it seems that I'm, I don't know, starting a collection, I guess. So if you think it's worth getting one and adding it to my collection, let me know. I know, I have problems. Anyway, the QMX comes as a kit for about $102 US as of September 20th, 2024. If kit building isn't your thing, you can get a built one with the enclosure for about $172 US delivered. Unfortunately though, you're probably gonna to have to wait between four and six months to get one built. A friend of mine ordered one at the beginning of May, 2024, and it took about, I think four months uh, for him to get it. So it kind of depends on the size of the build queue when you order. Okay, let's talk specs. The size of the enclosure without the knobs is three and three quarter inches wide by two and a half inches tall by one inch thick. It can be configured to output five watts at either 12 volts or nine volts of input. You have to pick one or the other at build time. Whatever you choose, you can only vary that input by plus or minus one volt. Otherwise the rig goes into protection mode and it won't let you transmit. So practically speaking, what that means is if you have one built for 12 volts and you hook it up to something like a BioNO battery, the rig is not gonna transmit because the BioNO battery puts out something like three and a half volts. A lot of folks don't realize that and end up scratching their heads for a while until they read the manual. So if you got a bio on a battery or something like that, you're gonna need a buck converter or something to step the voltage down below 13 volts. Or use a battery that puts out less voltage like a lead acid battery or some other chemistry or some other configuration. In my opinion, that's one of the two annoyances this rig has. The second annoyance is coming in a little bit. The rig draws 80 milliamps on receive and 700 milliamps on transmit at 12 volts. If you configured it for nine volts, then it's gonna draw one amp on transmit. On the left side, you have two three and a half millimeter or eighth inch jacks. One is for the CW paddle and one is for the audio output. Below that, you have a barrel connector for power. On the right side, you have a USB-C port for cat control. And yes, it has a built-in sound card for digital modes. Below the USB-C port, you have a 3.5 millimeter PTT jack. That can be configured to key amplifiers. You have some settings that you have to tweak to get that to work, but it does work because I was able to do it with my MXP50M amplifier. That's that silver Chinese uh, 45 watt amplifier you find on eBay a lot. If anyone is interested in how to do that, let me know in the comments and I'll make a walkthrough video on how to set this up to work with an amp. Lastly, you have the female BNC antenna connector on the right side. On the front below the screen, you have two knobs and two buttons. That's it. There's no internal speaker like any of the palm sized rig. Okay, let's walk through some of the commonly used features focusing around CW. This is the 80 through 20 version configured for 12 volts of power. It's currently running version 1.00.027 of the firmware. This seems to be a very stable and feature rich version of the firmware. So let's get to the controls. You long press the left knob to turn the rig on and off. And watch it when I switch it on, it'll come up with the version over here. Turning the left knob sets your AF gain or volume. 
Single press the left knob to change the mode between digital and CW. For now, and eventually SSB. You can see the mode there. Double press the left knob to change bands. The two buttons in the center have functions, but in the menu it's good to know that the left acts as a select button and the right acts as an exit button. When you're not in the menu, a short press of the left button lets you change your key or speed. Double press the left button to enable RIT. And long press the left button to get into the menu. There are a lot of options that you can change here. A single press of the right button switches between VFO A, B, and split if you've enabled it in the configuration, which I have. Double press the right button to recall your frequency presets. You get 16 frequency memories. Long press the right button to copy VFO A to B or B to A. Turning the right knob tunes the VFO. Single press the right knob to change your tuning step. Double pressing the right knob selects message memories for playback, like your CQ message. You get 12 message memories that are 50 characters long. Most rigs like this only have one or two memories. Now, depending on how you have your settings configured, on the display in the upper left, you have the selected VFO and then the frequency. To the right of that, you have a space. That can be a single character or a space. The space means that you're in normal mode. The possible characters that could appear there are a P for practice mode, an M for message mode when you're playing back a recorded message, or S for safe mode. Safe mode means your rig isn't going to transmit because either of high uh, input voltage or a high SWR. If safe mode comes on, then just fix whatever the issue is, then go into the menu and back out again and it'll clear safe mode. To the right of that, you have your mode, which is either CW digital, right now, like I said, eventually a uh, single sideband as well, to the right of that, you have your S meter on the top and your SWR meter on the bottom. To the right of that, you have your battery voltage. It's configurable, so you can have it configured as a number like I have here, or a graphical representation that looks like a battery that's, uh, I think, completely full at 13 volts and empty at 11 volts. On the second line, you have the decoded text if you have the CW decoder like I have turned on. Or you can have the VFO B frequency if you're running split or the RIT offset if you've enabled RIT. To the right of that, possibly you have the clock turned on. Unfortunately, the clock gets reset when you power the rig off. That's the other annoyance the, this rig has. It doesn't keep track of the time when you switch the rig off. I happen to have the clock turned off. The menu has quite a few settings. This video would be way too long if I went through all of them. Some of the interesting things to know are, for CW, you can operate in full or semi-break-in mode. The CW pitch is configurable along with the filter bandwidth that can be set from 950 hertz wide all the way down to 50 hertz. That's kind of uncommon for rigs like this. It also has an automatic gain control that's configurable in the menu, high SWR protection, and high voltage protection. Some other cool features are it can beacon whisper, and you could use it for digital modes like FT8. And like I said, it has a real-time clock. There is an interesting mode in the settings that you can configure to output a continuous tone at a certain percentage of your maximum power, like 50% or something like that. When you switch it on, it displays your SWR, so you could use that with a manual or an automatic antenna tuner. I'll demonstrate with a manual tuner that's attached to this. It's in hardware tests. This is it, tune SWR. We'll select that. And then right now it's not transmitting. As soon as I press this, and I have it configured for 75% my maximum power. As soon as I press this, you're going to see what the SWR is. So right now the SWR is 1.04. I'm going to mess with the tuner off screen here so you, you can't see it, but I'm turning the capacitors on the tuner. You see how I'm knocking the SWR out of whack. So you can use that to tune.
Okay, I'm going to compare the QMX to the Venus SW3B because they're close in size and price. I'm going to highlight some of the differences and reasons why I think the QMX is a better value. If you don't know, the SW3B is a great three-band CW-only rig that covers 20, 30, and 40 meters. The QMX, on the other hand, gives you five bands, and you could select from three different band groups. The SW3B has one message memory, and the QMX has 12. The QMX has an SW meter, whereas the SW3B does not. The QMX has configurable filter bandwidths and adjustable CW pitch. The SW3B filter bandwidth and CW pitch are fixed. The QMX has two VFOs and it allows you to operate split. You have to fake split operation with XIT on the SW3B. The QMX gives you digital modes and eventually single sideband. The SW3B is a CW only rig. The QMX gives you a CW decoder if you're into that. The SW3B does not have that option. Now, what are some of the advantages the SW3B has over the QMX? Well, a real practical one is the SW3B can operate over a wide input voltage range between 8 and 15 volts. That is very useful. The SW3B also gives you an external RF gain knob, which is really nice too. But other than that, well, there isn't much more. Cost-wise, the SW3B is about $16 more expensive than the QMX if you have it built with the enclosure. And it's $66 more expensive if you buy the QMX kit with the enclosure. You can see the values with the QMX. I love the SW3B, don't get me wrong, but you get so many more features with the QMX. It's a clear winner. If you have to choose just one, it's going to be the QMX. Now, if you have gear acquisition syndrome like me, well then, you're probably just going to buy both of them and blame me. So, you're welcome. With that, from the shack of Joe, November 2, Delta, India, I wish you all good health and a very 73. Bye-bye.